Say you're buying a pipe organ. Maybe it's a 449 rank pipe organ. Happens occasionally. You're writing out the specification and your organ architect comes up with something like this. <clears throat> Voice number 141, trumpet clarion four, which is this guy. 80 pipes, metal, harm, period, 3.5 inch scale, straight, 30 inches of wind. Part of the division's first read chorus. That's an author's note. So let's unpack some of that, shall we? Obviously, the number of notes is 80 because of the compass of the keyboard. But where it says metal, harm, let's take a look at that. Metal obviously means that the pipes are made out of metal. More on that later. The harm part means harmonic, which means that at a certain point, the pipes become double length for their pitch. Now that is not to say that the pitch changes. When you're at the console and you play a scale up the keyboard, you don't hear any change in the pitch of the sound. The, the notes go up in the regular order as you would always hear them. But for greater carrying power, the resonator is made twice as long to give the sound waves more time and more space to develop before they escape and make their sound in the rest of the auditorium. Now it says three and a half inch scale. Okay, now remember if you saw my previous video on pipe purchasing parameters, we talked about the scale of flue pipes. It doesn't work the same way in reed pipes. It does to a point, but not exactly. 3.5 inch scale simply means that at bottom C, the top of the resonator is three and a half inches in diameter. Now, unlike flue pipes, which we talked about last time, there is no set halving ratio on reeds. It just doesn't work that way. It's more or less up to the manufacturer to use their experience to determine what works best from bass to treble. The halving ratio on reed pipes wouldn't work out. It, it doesn't make sense the same way because the numbers would be so high, they're basically irrelevant. Basically, you can think that the diameter of reed pipes stay more or less the same from bass to treble. They get somewhat smaller, but not nearly to the same extent as reed pipes. And there are some reed stops out there like Crumhorns, especially some that were built in the 1960s and 70s. I can think of some Moeller examples, some Schantz examples, where the resonators are made from tubing that stays the same diameter from bass to treble. There's no change. The only thing that changes is the length. But in this case, we have a trumpet, clarion, a four foot trumpet is simply called a clarion. And the reeds at the top, the very top reed pipe is this big and an octave lower or two octaves lower, it's still almost exactly the same. So that doesn't apply. When you order pipes, reeds especially, and I'm limiting my talk here to trumpets because there's so many different kinds of reeds. I mean, we could take an hour for, for that by itself, and maybe I will sometime. But you just don't have as much control over the finished product as when you have flue pipes made. That is to say, there's more of a thing of you tell the people making the pipes what you want them to sound like and you more or less leave the rest up to them. You tell them, I want a bright sound, I want a dark sound, or something like that, and then it's up to them to decide how you get there. And how do you get there? Well, there are several different ways. One, we talk about scaling, but scaling, as far as the diameter, again, does not have the same effect on reed pipes that it does on flue pipes. You can have a reed pipe, which is quite small in diameter, but still produces a sound relatively lacking in upper harmonics. That is a kind of a dark sound because there are other factors at work. So you can have scale. You can have uh, what kind of tuning method. Now, this is one place where Senator Richards was smart in this organ. Obviously, I'm here at, at Boardwalk Hall in the Swell Division. He specified no scroll tuners. If you look at all of the reed pipes in the organ, no matter where they are, they either have a sleeve that moves up and down or they have a scroll that turns sideways, but at no point is there a scroll cut into the side of the pipe and opened up like a sardine can. 
which is standard practice and works perfectly well in, in most circumstances. But what he was thinking is that you tune something over and over and over, and if you move the scroll up and down over and over and over, what happens? Metal fatigue, and they can fall off. Now, many times with spotted metal pipes, that just doesn't happen because the lead and the tin are flexible enough that they can take repeated uh, stress like that and they don't break off. But another thing that happens is that the scroll deforms and it won't roll up nicely against the side of the pipe and you get leaks, which aren't good for anybody, right? So you can have what kind of tuning method you, you want. A big part of the sound of a trumpet pipe or any reed pipe comes from the shallot. The shallot is the little piece of brass in the bottom of the pipe where the reed tongue sits. Now here, courtesy of Brant Duddy, by the way, here is a shallot that Brant had in some, some old pipes. This is what you call a parallel shallot because the sides of the shallot are parallel. There are very few of these in this organ. Most shallots in this organ are what we call conical or tapered, and that is to say that they are larger at the bottom than they are at the top. This fits into the reed block, and then the reed tongue goes on top. Now here's an example that was in the uh, organ shop downstairs. This is off of some, probably a Wurlitzer, I'm guessing. And so the shallot is the brass part here, and you have a reed tongue, in this case a very thick reed tongue with a weight on it, which then hits the opening of the shallot when it's applied air pressure and sends the puffs of air up into the resonator. The shape of the shallot has a huge influence on the sound of the pipe, and that's where a lot of the brightness or darkness comes from, is this shape. Very dark sounding, opaque sounding reeds like English trombas, cornopians, tubas, and so on, have a strongly tapered shallot. It, it flares out a lot at the bottom, and the opening is quite restricted. Brilliant stops like French trompettes or uh, French trompettes or clarions or anything like that will have parallel shallots because the larger the area toward the bottom, the more fundamental the sound. I don't know exactly why it works that way because the entire opening is being opened and closed with every cycle, but that is the way it works. So you could have a parallel shallot in a large scale pipe and it would still sound quite brilliant even though the scale is very large. Consequently, if you go the other way, you can have a strongly tapered shallot with a small scaled resonator and it'll sound quite dark. Moeller did that a lot on their uh, Artiste series organs. They have trumpets that are real tiny. We call them pea shooter trumpets, and they have strongly tapered shallots so that they don't sound too thin and buzzy. They actually, a lot of them sound actually pretty good, I think. So you can do that. You can also specify, as we said, the wind pressure. Now, I'm, I'm gonna come to that in a second, but another thing which varies from builder to builder is how the shallot meets up at the tip in the reed block and then the resonator starts. If you have a smaller tip, it creates sort of an impedance, I've heard it called an acoustical impedance with the resonator and it, it wants to feel that, that back pressure when it's playing and it actually gives better control, some people think, as opposed to having it wide open so that there's no restriction there. Now these parallel shallots have, they're wide open and so you're going to get a different effect that way. Well, let's talk about wind pressure for a minute. People think that wind pressure is the be-all and end-all of volume. That's not the way it works. It has something to do with it, but it is not the whole story, okay? Back in the day, you had organs on very low wind pressure that could create enormous amounts, enormous amounts of volume. And the reason for that is because when you have lower wind pressure, you necessarily have a thinner reed tongue. And of course, reed tongues are just pieces of brass, which are then curved with a burnishing iron or, or another tool against the shallot. These two don't go together, of course, but it creates a gap there. And it's a spring, 
it's literally just an air-driven spring that closes the opening and, and repeatedly opens it up over and over and over. Well, let's think about this a second. What happens if you have a reed tongue that's too thin on very high wind pressure? It's going to simply slam shut against the opening, clunk, and it's not going to open again. There's not going to be any sound. The other way to go is that if you had low wind pressure and a very thick reed tongue, what will that do? Nothing. It's just going to sit there and it's not going to have enough force to close the opening of the shallot. So it's just going to sit there and air is going to go through it and it's not going to speak that way either. So there is a fairly narrow window of reed tongue thickness versus wind pressure. And then of course the shallot design goes from there. If you want something that sounds like the state trumpet at St. John the Divine, you're going to have shallots with an angle on the bottom so that all of the sound and energy coming from here is not cushioned inside the shallot and is pushed directly out to the resonator. On the other hand, if you want something like a French horn that has no harmonics and is as smooth as possible, you'll have a strongly tapered shallot with a very small opening at the bottom. And that chokes off everything and makes an extremely fundamental sound for a reed pipe. But again, talking about wind pressure, it is not the end all and be all of volume. And I'm going to show a, a couple of clips here where I took a sound pressure level meter and went into a couple different organs and measured what kind of sound we got out. Let's take a look at that. Uh, again, please. Folks, it is October 9th, 2023, and I'm here at the organ of First Presbyterian Church in my home area here of Charleston, West Virginia. This organ was built in 1980, and it is blisteringly loud. I mean, this thing is headache inducing. It's a great piece of work, but wow, does it pack a punch. And you know what? The entire organ is on only three inches of wind pressure. So everybody uh, so many times in the comments of these YouTube videos say, oh, you know, it's on such and such wind pressure. It must be so loud. Not necessarily. And I'm going to show why the construction of reed pipes actually has a lot more to do with volume than the wind pressure. So I'm going to carefully turn the camera here. OK, Scott, play top E. OK, there's an organ supply wind pressure gauge. I'm just showing you this organ is on exactly three inches of wind three count them three individual inches of wind pressure okay now i've got a sound pressure level meter here and i'm going to show exactly how loud these trumpets are on three inches of wind okay scott play middle c you see that that was 111 decibels okay play a chord 113 decibels of volume on three inches of wind pressure because the shallots are very open and the reed tongues are relatively thin. So there you have it. I just thought this little uh, interlude in one of the videos you'd find interesting. So to sum up, you can specify starting scale and basically the wind pressure and your idea of what you want the trumpets to sound like. Bright, dark, somewhere in between, up to you. And then it's up to the person making the pipes or the company making the pipes to determine how best to deliver the product to you as the organ purchaser. So next time you order a 449 rank organ, take this information into account next time you order a big bunch of trumpets.